few weeks ago that Naya had a bit of a knock to her head, which gave her double vision for quite some time, and the, the uh, medical team weren't sure whether it would go away or whether she'd be left with it permanently. Well, the good news is it's gone completely, and uh, she's able to see perfectly now, which is great, and um, means she can. She wasn't allowed to drive, I don't think, for a while, but she's able to do all those things now. So we're thankful for that and thankful to the Lord, and I'm sure Alan's thankful for that too, so I uh, just wanted to let you guys know about that. We'll take your Bibles and go to uh, Mark's Gospel, chapter 15, again. The death penalty is, is not a subject that many of us like to talk about. There are still 58 countries in our world that use the death penalty as a punishment for crimes. The United States is uh, one of those countries that still use the death penalty. In fact, there's 31 of the um, states in America still have the death penalty or capital punishment as it's known in their, in their country. And when a person is on death row, when a criminal is on death row in the United States, they can choose their mode of execution depending on which state they come from. So they could choose to be uh, to receive a lethal injection or gas inhalation or electrocution or hanging or even the firing squad. And all of those methods of execution are designed to be reasonably quick and to minimize the pain. In some countries like Saudi Arabia and Iran and Somalia, stoning is still a legal form of capital punishment. And there is another mode of execution that existed for about a thousand years that is considered to be one of the worst types of execution, and that is crucifixion. A crucifixion was designed to be brutal and shameful. It was one of the most gruesome methods available to bring punishment and to bring judgment upon its victims. And as we return to Mark's gospel this morning, Crucifixion was an execution technique that the Romans imposed on notorious criminals and prisoners of war and sometimes rebellious slaves. But it wasn't the Romans who invented crucifixion as a death penalty. They'd been taking place for many years before the Romans were in power, at least 500 years before the Romans came into power. There were crucifixions in places like the Persian Empire and among the Assyrians, and even the Indians. In fact, there are historical records that tell us that there were often large groups of people who were crucified all at the same time. King Darius from Persia crucified 3,000 Babylonians all at the same time. Likewise, Alexander the Great, he crucified 2,000 of the survivors of the siege of Tyre. And history tells us that those victims hung on crosses overlooking the Mediterranean Sea. That particular group of crucifixions took place about 350 years before the time of Christ. Josephus also writes about a large-scale crucifixion that took place about 100 years before Christ, where there were 800 Jewish Pharisees who were crucified, and at the same time, their their wives and their children were slaughtered in front of them. And it was events like that one that made crucifixion such a disgusting thought in the minds of any Jewish person. And when the Romans came into power, which was 63 BC, they continued to perform crucifixions as a mode of dealing with the worst kinds of criminals. Even for many years after Christ, the the Romans continued to enforce the death penalty by crucifixion. Some of you will be familiar, I'm sure, with the Roman emperor called Nero, who crucified Christians in his garden after the burning of Rome in AD 64. And history also tells us that it was Nero who crucified the apostle Peter. And then a few years after that, in AD 70, during the destruction of Jerusalem, Titus, who was the the Roman official, not Titus, the New Testament guy, but the, the Roman official, he ordered that so many, he ordered so many crucifixions that they ran out of crosses to be able to, to crucify the victims. And then it wasn't until about 300 AD that crucifying criminals 
became or was completely abolished. And I believe it was Constantine who abolished crucifixions, and he did it in honor of Christ, who he believed in and followed. And so when we pick up Mark's gospel now in Mark chapter 15, and we read in in verse 15, where we finished up last Sunday, Pilate delivered Jesus to be crucified. This was nothing new in that culture. Crucifixions were as common in that first century culture as petrol price rises are in ours. <laughs> they happened all the time. And even though the Romans crucified criminals, it was usually reserved for non-Romans. They would crucify, as, as I said before, they would crucify as, um, rebe- rebellious slaves. They would crucify those guilty of treason. They would crucify enemies who had been captured in military conquests. And for a, for a Roman citizen to be crucified, they had to have done something really, really bad. They had to have committed some kind of great offense to the country, some kind of national security crime against their country. But as Christians, we can proclaim boldly along with the Apostle Paul. We preach Christ what? crucified. And so this morning, we're going to take that journey with Christ from the time of Pilate's sentence through to the first three hours of Christ hanging on that Roman cross. It was a, a painful journey. And I've called the message today the physical agony of the cross. And so the emphasis today is going to be on the physical suffering that Christ faced. Next time, in a couple of weeks' time, we're going to look at the spiritual agony of the cross. But as we look at the verses 16 to 32 this morning, we're going to identify nine specific areas of physical or verbal abuse that Christ endured. And let's not forget, as we look at this, that he did it on our behalf. He did this in our place. This painful journey of Christ is the journey that all of us should have taken instead of him. Well, I want to read the passage to us this morning. So Mark 15, beginning in verse 16, and we'll go down to verse 32. It says this, And the soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is the governor's headquarters, And they called together the whole battalion, and they clothed him in a purple cloak, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on him. And they began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews! And they were striking his head with a reed, and spitting on him, and kneeling down in homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak, and put his own clothes on him. And they led led him out to crucify him. And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. And they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, and they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him, and the inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. And those who crucified, those who were crucified with him also reviled him. Well, we're going to identify those nine areas of physical and verbal abuse that Christ suffered on our behalf. And To begin with, I just want to quickly backtrack to where we finished off last Sunday in verse 15, where Pilate ordered Jesus to be scourged, to be be whipped. So I want to begin there. This is the first area, the scourging or the whipping. As we mentioned last time, Jesus had been whipped. 
possibly up to 39 times. We don't know exactly how many times, but he was whipped with a whip that was designed to inflict, inflict grievous bodily harm. His back muscles and skin would have been damaged extensively by those sharp bones and metal that were attached to the ends of the whip. And as I said last time, these whippings were so brutal in some cases that the victims died before they even got to the cross. And so Jesus faced that kind of whipping, and he faced it in a public area, so it seems. And then in verse 16, it says that he was led away back into Herod's palace. This was to get him ready and prepared to take him from that place to outside the city to the venue where the crucifixions were going to take place. And so in order to make this journey um, without the criminal escaping and to avoid any kind of possible crowd interference, there needed to be some sort of high security put in place. And so it says there in verse 16 that the whole battalion was summoned. This is the Roman soldiers. There, there probably would have been 200, 300 Roman soldiers, possibly even up to 600 soldiers. That's how many a battalion was. And these were probably the Roman soldiers that had come with Pilate to Jerusalem. Remember, Pilate didn't live there. He lived in Caesarea, and he had probably brought these soldiers with him. But before they even start out on the journey from the palace, this six or seven hundred meter journey it would have been from the palace to Golgotha, we see a second episode of physical abuse here. And that is that Jesus is mocked by the soldiers. Look at verse 17. These soldiers, they thought it was a great joke that this quiet and this gentle Jew claimed to be a king. Now, we've got a cat at our place that likes to catch mice and birds and then taunt them. She'll catch, the, she'll catch them and she'll let them go and they'll run away a little bit and then she'll catch them again and then she'll injure them a little bit more and taunt them until eventually these things die. And then she just leaves them lying around outside and inside the house for us to get rid of them. Well, the soldiers start doing the very same thing with Jesus. They've already caught him, and now they begin to taunt him and to injure him and to mock him. And so they take a cloak, it says here, possibly just an old military cloak, and they force Jesus to put it on because they want to dress up Jesus so that he looks like a king. Remember, the charge against him was that he was a king and therefore a threat to the Roman government. And so it was a mocking insult for these Roman soldiers to, to say to Jesus, Hail, King of the Jews. And none of the Romans actually believed that. And most of the Jews didn't actually believe that, that Jesus was a king. And so in those days, kings wore these radiant colored robes, and so they make Jesus put on this pretend garment just to make him look like a king. And no doubt this was a somewhat painful exercise considering the wounds that Jesus already had on his back. And some of us know what it's like to get sunburned on our back or on our shoulders and to put clothes on over top of that. Well, this would have been far worse for Jesus who was carrying the, the wounds of his whipping. And then to make Jesus look more like a king, they give him a crown, not made of gold and silver or precious, with precious stones or jewels in it, but a crown of thorns woven together. This is the third area of physical abuse that we see, the crown of thorns. And it doesn't say in the text what type of thorns they used. However, there was obviously some sort of quick and easy supply to be able to get these thorns. It could have possibly been... Taken, they could have been taken from some of the palm branches that would have been easily available in that time. Remember, it was the palm branches that were thrown down on the ground just a few days earlier when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. Well, once these thorns are woven together into a circular shape, one of the soldiers takes it and forces it onto Jesus' head, no doubt adding to the pain and the bleeding that Jesus was already experiencing. And then Matthew even tells us that the soldiers, they grab a stick or some kind of reed and they put it into Jesus' hand because they want it to, to be a pretend scepter like a king would carry, a bit like a staff. And so Jesus was dressed up to look like a king, 
And then in a barrage of mocking gestures, the soldiers continue to taunt Jesus. Verse 18, they began to salute Jesus and say, Hail, King of the Jews. And the grammar at this point indicates that many of them were doing this over and over again to Jesus. The physical abuse continues in verse 19. This is the fourth thing, and that is the the striking of his head. Verse 19 says, and they were striking his head with a reed. The same type of reed or the same type of stick that they gave Jesus to mimic a royal scepter was then used to hit Jesus on the head. Maybe it was Jesus just refused to hold on to that reed, and so they took that reed or that stick and they used it to hit Jesus. And I don't think these soldiers would have been holding back as they hit Jesus. This was not just a little conductor's movement here. These were full blown swings. In these soldiers' minds, Jesus was a criminal. And they would hit him with full force. I mean, they've already hit him with whips and scourged him, which was incredibly painful. And now they continue the physical abuse by hitting him. And I'm sure where it says here, beating him on the head, it was an attempt to hit the crown of thorns and force it into his scalp even more to inflict more and more pain. And then the next phase of the physical attacks continued in the end of verse 19 there, and that is the spitting at Jesus. The humiliation and the abuse just continues to roll out. They spat on Jesus, just as some of the soldiers and even some of the Jewish leaders had done earlier in the night back in those Jewish trials. They spat on Jesus, just a disgusting, gross thing to do. And Isaiah 52 verse 14 reminds us that Jesus' appearance would be marred more than any man. And so as Jesus is receiving these these blows and being spat upon, and as he's bleeding, he's becoming more and more unrecognizable. And so as the blood and the sweat and the saliva drips off Jesus' face, these merciless soldiers They kneel down before Jesus to offer him their mocking expressions of worship at the end of verse 19. They kneel down in homage to him. And let me me remind you, this: there was not an ounce of reverence or respect or honor in any of these actions. This is all full-on mockery of Jesus. And when you think about it, it's absolutely crazy, isn't it? This is, these are soldiers doing this to their very creator. The very one who is sustaining them, the very one who is giving them life to live, who's giving them breath to live and keeping their hearts beating, they are doing this to him. They are mocking the one who is the eternal son of God, the the one who left heaven above and one of the greatest expressions of, of love known to mankind. This is who they're mocking. And they're treating him as if he's the world's worst criminal, when in reality he's innocent. He's the savior of the world, not the greatest criminal. Verse 20 says, and when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and they put his own clothes on him and they led him out to crucify him. No doubt this was another painful experience as the clothing was ripped off Jesus, no concern for the agony it would have caused to his bleeding wounds. Which takes us to the next step of his physical agony, where it says there, and they led him out. They led him out to crucify him. This is what I call the the painful journey. The journey to the cross. The journey to Golgotha. It was a physically demanding journey for Jesus after all that had happened to him. The route that they would have taken is referred to today as the Via Dolorosa, which means the, the, the way of suffering or the, the painful way. It's the pathway that Jesus walked from the, the palace to get to the, the scene of his crucifixion. And John tells us in his gospel that when Jesus left Herod's palace, he was bearing or he was carrying his own cross. 
probably it wasn't the full cross, it would have just been the, the cross beam that he would have been carrying. And some people would suggest that it would have weighed something like 20 to 30 kilograms, maybe even more than that. This would have been a difficult assignment for Jesus. Jesus is physically exhausted. Remember, he has not slept all night. He's been up all night. Remember the previous evening, he's been celebrating the Passover with his disciples. And then he went straight from there to the Garden of Gethsemane where he prayed for a couple of hours. And it was in that garden that Jesus was arrested. And then the rest of the evening, he's gone through those six unfair, unjust trials. And then after that, he endured the whipping and some of these other physical abuses that we've just mentioned. And so now it's Friday morning, and it's probably around about 7 or 8 o'clock. And he's expected now to carry his own cross. It would have been hugely difficult for him, especially with his back muscles ripped to shreds, having been beaten and bleeding from the whipping. Probably his body and his muscles were somewhat in shock. And it just seems that Jesus was physically incapable of carrying his cross. Probably even started to carry it and collapsed under the weight. Hence the reason why Simon of Cyrene was called in to help. Because the soldiers, they were keen to get this crucifixion done and dusted. They didn't want to wait around. They didn't want any delays. And they certainly weren't going to pick up and carry the cross for Jesus. And so they compel this man. They literally forced this passerby by the name of Simon of Cyrene. He was coming in from the country, it says, and he was the father of Alexander and Rufus. And so they get this guy in to carry the cross for Jesus. Simon was no doubt a Jewish man, and he was in Jerusalem for the Passover. And there's obviously a lot of people in Jerusalem. There's no vacancies in Jerusalem. So it says he's coming in from the country where he would have been staying. He's walking into Jerusalem. And he just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Or probably I should say he was in the right place at the right time. Because it is very likely that this was a life-changing event for Simon. Many believe that this event led to his conversion. And to the subsequent salvation of his sons. It it names his sons there, Alexander and Rufus, because... When Paul wrote the letter to the Romans, he greeted one of the saints in Rome, and that saint's name was Rufus. And remember, when Mark is writing this gospel, he's writing it to the Romans. And so that's why he points out the relationship between Simon and his son Rufus, because Rufus is most likely now in the church in Rome. And so this is divine providence working its way out in Simon's life. And then in verse 22, it says, And they brought him, to Jesus, to the place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull. So eventually Jesus arrives here at Golgotha, which was outside of the city. That's where they crucified everybody. They wouldn't crucify them in the middle of the city. And it's called the place of the skull. It's also called Calvary. And the reason why they call it Calvary is because Calva is the Latin word for skull. And so there's a bit of debate today as to the exact location of Golgotha. Um, Natalie and I had the opportunity to go to Israel a long time ago now, about 21, 22 years ago. And there is one particular site that if you you look a little bit sideways and you squint a little bit, it does sort of look a little bit like a skull. And so many people believe that's the area where it is, but there's no definitive Uh, information on it. But the exact location isn't important. It's what took place there that's of most importance to us. Well, the next issue relating to Jesus' physical suffering didn't actually add to his pain. It simply meant that it didn't get reduced. And that's what I call the seventh thing here, the sedative refused, or the non-use of a painkiller. Verse 23 says there, they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. This was a first century painkiller that according to tradition was provided by the Jewish woman as a sedative to reduce the physical pain that a victim would suffer as they were crucified. It was wine mixed with myrrh. Myrrh had some kind of anesthetic properties 
Matthew tells us that Jesus had a small sip of it, but then he didn't drink it at all. He didn't want to, <clears throat> he didn't want to limit his faculties in any way. He didn't want to take this painkiller. We know that strong wine is often used as a sedative in some cultures, I mean, even in New Zealand, right? Not only to help people when they might feel sick, but many use it as a means to escape both physical and emotional pain. Well, Jesus refused the painkiller. Instead, he accepted the full extent of the physical pain that he was suffering. And then we move on to the eighth area or the eighth round of physical abuse, and that is the actual crucifixion. Verse 24 simply says, and they crucified him. Mark doesn't give us much information about this at all and about the details of the crucifixion because he didn't need to at that point because it was such a common practice in that culture that everybody was familiar with the practice. And as I said earlier, the, the crucifixion is one of the cruelest forms of capital punishment. And the Romans were experts at it. They say that the Romans by this time had crucified something like up to three or so 30,000 men. And I thought twice about what I was going to, about what, whether or not I would read this next quote to you, but I decided I'd read it because it gives us a realistic understanding of the physical agony of someone who is being crucified. This comes from a book called Crucifixion of Jesus. It's a medical doctor who has put this together, called a guy called Truman Davis, who's done a lot of in-depth investigation into the physical struggles and agonies of a crucifixion. He says this in relation to Jesus. He says, Simon of Cyrene is ordered to place the cross beam on the ground. And Jesus is quickly thrown backward with his shoulders against the wood. The Roman soldier feels for the depression at the front of the wrist. He, he drives a heavy, square, wrought iron nail through the wrist and deep into the wood. Quickly he moves to the other side and repeats the action, being careful not to pull the arms too tightly, but to allow some flexion and movement. The cross beam is then lifted in place at the top of the vertical beam. The left foot is now pressed backward against the right foot with both feet extended, toes down. A nail is driven through the arch of each, leaving the knees moderately <laughs> flexed. The victim is now crucified. As he slowly sags down with more weight on the nails in the wrists, excruciating pain shoots along the fingers and up the arms to explode in the brain. The nails in the wrists are putting pressure on the median nerves, and as he pushes himself upward to avoid the stretching torment, he places his full weight on the nail through his feet. Again, there is the searing agony of the nail tearing through the nerves between the metatarsal bones of the feet. At this point, as the arms fatigue, Great waves of cramps sweep through the muscles, knotting them in deep, relentless, throbbing pain. With these cramps comes the inability to push himself upward. Hanging by his arms, the pectoral muscles are paralyzed and are unable to act. Air can be drawn into the lungs, but cannot be exhaled. Jesus fights to raise himself in order to get even one short breath. Finally, carbon dioxide builds up in the lungs and the bloodstream and the cramps partially subside. Spasmodically, he is able to push himself upward to exhale and bring in the life-giving oxygen. Jesus experienced hours of limitless pain, cycles of twisting, joint-rendering cramps, intermittent partial asphyxiation, searing pain where tissue is torn from the lacerated back as he moves up and down against the rough timber. Then, uh, then another agony begins, a terrible, crushing pain deep in the chest as the pericardium, that's the bit around the heart, slowly fills with serum and begins to compress the heart. It is now almost over. The loss of tissue fluids has reached a critical level. The, comp the compressed heart is struggling to pump heavy, thick, sluggish blood into the tissue the tortured lungs are making a frantic effort to gasp in small gulps of air. 
the body of Jesus is now in extremis, and he can feel the chill of death creeping through his tissues. He says a whole lot more, but I'll leave it there. This is a horrific way to die. But this is Jesus being battered and bruised and bleeding for you and for me. As the songwriter says, bearing shame and scoffing rude, in my place condemned he stood. Hallelujah. What a Savior. And then in fulfillment of Psalm 22 that we read earlier, Mark tells us this. The soldiers who carried out the crucifixion, John tells us that there was four of them. They take Jesus' clothes, his, his inner clothing, his outer clothing, his belt and his sandals, and they divide Jesus' garments among them. And for his clothing, they cast lots, just as Psalm 22, a thousand years or so earlier predicted. And then Mark gives a a quick summary of the situation in verses 25 to 27. He talks about the time of the crucifixion. He says it was the third hour. And the Jewish method of telling the time went from sunrise to sunset. So the day started at sunrise for them, which was 6 a.m. So the third hour would be 9 a.m. And then he talks about the charge. That is that Jesus was accused and charged and charged for the crime of being the king of the Jews. And so it was a a Roman custom to write that description and attach it to the cross. And so that's what they did with Jesus. It was nailed above his head. And by the way, when the criminal normally walked to the site of the crucifixion, they would usually wear that accusation around their neck so that people could see what they were going to be punished for, what their crime was. And then Mark talks about the robbers here as well. We know that Jesus was not crucified alone. There were two others, two guys who were referred to as robbers, two men who were most likely, or most likely had committed the crime of treason against the Roman government. In fact, these guys were probably friends of Barabbas. In fact, they were probably part of the, the scheme that Barabbas was a part of when they got caught, the rebellion against the Roman officials. <clears throat> and then the... The physical abuse and the verbal abuse continues, and this is the ninth and last area of physical abuse that we see, and that is the mocking continues in verses 29 to 32. As Jesus is hanging there on a cross between heaven and earth, as it were, the mocking is relentless. Verse 29 talks about those people who were passing by. Uh, Golgotha was on a public highway, it was on a public road, so people were coming and going all of the time. Remember, it was Passover, so there was a lot of people there. And obviously, because it was Jesus, there would have been a crowd there as well. And some of them who were passing by are just shouting out to Jesus and mocking him, using the very things that had been used back in the Jewish court. You will destroy this temple and raise it in three days, they say, but Jesus obviously was talking about his body, not the literal temple. And then there's the religious leaders who are still there mocking him as well. They're not going to be satisfied, these guys, until Jesus is dead. And so they're hanging around and they're throwing insults and they're still disbelieving about who Jesus is and his true identity. And and they yell out, he saved others, and probably talking about the miracles Jesus had done and talking about the raising of Lazarus. He saved others, but he cannot save himself. You know, there's a famous sermon, some of you may have heard, it's ca- heard it, it's called, It's Friday, but Sunday's coming. Probably a good sermon for these Jewish leaders to hear. The Jewish leaders were going to be in for the shock of their lives in a couple of days' time, three days' time. They say he will not save himself. Well, in one sense that's true, but in three days later he will. Not in the way that they're thinking but Jesus will be resurrected from the dead. And so they mockingly shout out again in verse 32, let the Christ, let the Messiah, that is, the King of Israel, come down from the cross that we may see and believe. Well, all we can say to that is come back in three days to see what happens. And then the third lot of people mocking Jesus were the two criminals crucified beside him, it says, which is 
kind of surprising because these guys are getting what they deserve. They are guilty criminals. And they too start joining in the mocking of Jesus. It says there, those who were crucified with him also reviled him. I guess these guys have got nothing to lose. So initially they start mocking Jesus, but obviously it was after this mocking that one of them has a change of heart. He starts to reevaluate his situation and his condition. And Luke records for us the conversation between the two robbers where one of them says to the other, the other rebuked him saying, do you not fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward for our deeds. In other words, we're guilty, but this man has done nothing wrong. Isn't that interesting? One of the robbers knows Jesus is innocent. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Let me say this again, just to remind us. And we need to remind ourselves of this, I think. Jesus is standing in our place. This is Jesus dying for us. The just for the unjust. The innocent taking the place of the guilty. We're the unjust and we're the guilty. Jesus is giving up his life so that we can have life. And so this story is the heart and soul of Christianity, that Jesus Christ died for sinners. And there still is part two to come because this is only the physical suffering. We still need to look at the spiritual suffering that Jesus faced, which was significantly more greater than the physical. We'll look at that in a couple of weeks. But just to finish, notice what Jesus says, or what, what, sorry, what was said in verse 31. He saved others. He cannot save himself. These words were used as words of mockery, but there's a lot of irony in these words in some sense because they're true. He saved others, not just the, through the miracles and through raising Lazarus from the dead, but he saved us. <laughs> it's true, isn't it, of you and of me, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, that he saved us. And anyone else who puts their faith and their trust in Jesus Christ, he too has saved them. Jesus is our Savior. And as I said in that verse, the 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 leaders are yelling out, he cannot save himself. Well, Jesus could have saved himself. He could have called on 10,000 um, angels to come and rescue him any time, but he chose not to. Hebrews 12 tells us that Jesus, that we should look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Remember what it says ne next? Who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising its shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus chose not to save himself while he was on the cross. He chose to die, to take the full extent of the punishment that we deserve. Three days later, he's going to rise again. We'll look at that. Forty days later, he's going to ascend back to glory, and he's going to sit at the right hand of his Father on high, as that verse in Hebrews tells us. The wicked plans of men, the devious schemes of the devil are overshadowed in this whole story by the marvelous divine providential plan of salvation that God has put in place for us. And so in dying this horrific death on a cross, Jesus was willingly following his Father's will to provide a way of salvation for sinners like you and me. That's the good news of the cross. It is a divine pathway for our salvation. This is, you could say this morning, this is Jesus' body broken and his blood shed for us, even as we remember this morning as we've taken communion. And I guess the question we need to ask is, are you following Jesus? Are you following this Jesus who died for you and gave his life for you? If you are, fantastic. If you're not, come and see me. I'd love to chat with you afterwards. Let's pray. I think the guys are going to come and finish with a song. Lord, It's a sobering reminder to think through what Christ has done on our behalf. He has stood in our place. He has been our substitute, and we want to say thank you for that. Lord, thank you that the, the price has been paid. It is finished. It is done.
and that, Lord, all we need to do now is trust you and follow you and commit our lives to you and put our faith and belief in you, and we do that, and we thank you for enabling us to do that. Lord, if there's some here this morning that haven't done that, I pray that you would, you would guide their hearts to the truth and guide their hearts to understand truly who Jesus is so that they can follow him as their Lord and as their Savior. Lord, that would be our desire, that we would all love you, follow you, and live our lives for you, we pray in Jesus' name.